All right, guys. Uh, good morning, everyone. Or evening, sorry. It's been the wrong time zone. Um, I'm here to talk about the Nouveau project in the times of uh, firmware. Um, and just for those, I mean, I'm David Early. I'm a distinguished engineer. I work in Red Hat in Australia. Don't let the accent confuse you. I'm from here, but live there. Um, and um, I'm also the upstream kernel maintainer for all of graphics and a bunch of user space stuff and a few other projects. Uh, Nouveau, I don't work on that much anymore, but I'm going to give this topic because it's topical and I have been working on it lately. So I will start by just giving a little bit of hardware history from the NVIDIA side. This is more of a very sketchy summary. It's not entirely accurate. It's just quickly cobbled together from uh, Wikipedia. So, uh, but it gives you just an idea of how far back NVIDIA hardware stretches. It probably goes back a bit further, but how far back I've, we've cared to, to, to write for this. Um, you can pretty much ignore the first two lines. We've decided that that's too old to care about, but it started getting interesting really about 2006, the NV50, uh, it was a, the big change was the introduction of this per, per context virtual memory addresses. You'll see what that's important, but that's a, that was a major sort of turning point for the graphics that this started getting introduced. And then they kept progressing. You can see it's pretty much at every two year progression as they went on. Uh, you see the highlights of uh, Kepler was where Vulcan got supported. Um, Maxwell came in two parts. So it was Maxwell and Maxwell 2, which were pretty much the same, but they had some changes. And one of the ones was that was when I think called signed firmware started. And then we progressed up through things. We got Pascal, Volta, Turing, and Ampere. Um, and then have highlighted for Turing is a thing called GSP support. I'll we'll, we'll get to what that is and why it's important. So with Maxwell 2, this thing called signed firmware started to happen. And for secure boot reasons and other reasons, it was decided that you shouldn't be allowed to just write your own firmware for these devices. You need to get firmware that has been signed by NVIDIA and loaded into a number of little processors on the device. Um, this complicated stuff for the Nouveau project, and I'll get into that a little further, but the sort of compromise vision we had reached with NVIDIA over the last few years has been that they would provide us with signed firmware blobs that we would then poke into the GPU using Nouveau in various places. And there could be two of these, five of these. There was a number of them. And the sequence of ordering was very complicated. It's very hard to get right, unstable. Yeah, just it was it was it's been very painful for the last few years to make Nouveau go anywhere. And even when you've done that, all you got, succeeded in doing was turning the device on. You can't make it reclock, you can't make it go faster. Most devices get booted up at the slowest possible clock speeds because they just want to keep them the power off. So Pretty much when this started happening, this is when Nouveau sort of, well, we, we can't make it go fast. There's, what's, what's the investment? What's the future? It's like, it's, it became a bit of a, a big problem. I'll get into why, how, what we have to deal with later, but this is sort of a, a watershed line I want to identify early. But then recently around the Turing time, introduced with the NVIDIA R515 driver, there's a thing called GSP firmware. And this is a new development that NVIDIA rolled out. Um, it's only Turing and above. And what they've done is they've put a processor, which is a RISC-V based processor, onto the GPU. Now the GPU already has maybe six or seven little microprocessors on it. That's what we're putting up the firmware for. This is kind of like the one to rule them all <laughs> firm with GSP, RISC-V. Um, the firmware file for this, is in the range of 30 megabytes, 40 megabytes. It's not, most of our farmers up to now have been in the 256 Ks enough for any one type of space, but this is in the 30 megabytes is a lot of firmware. Um, but it requires this GSP uh, processor to be there. What a video have done is taken their driver, cut out the scissors, worked their way up through it, put all this part into the firmware, made a nice RPC APC, API between them, and then firmware, kernel, user space. So they've cut it up and added another little abstraction layer in the middle. Um, that sort of was announced at the same time as this project, which was that NVIDIA were going to provide an open source kernel module. This is a fork of their proprietary driver using the firmware 
where everything was in the firmware. And when they did that, it's like, oh, this layer between the firmware and the user space that's in the kernel, it's not really secret anymore. There's nothing we care about to really have to keep closed source anymore. So, well, we can actually, just, we have use cases where people have wanted an open source driver for that place. We can solve them. This was produced. So we, we've achieved at least the base level of an open source kernel driver for the, uh, when you have the GSP firmware, so the last two. Uh, unfortunately, this, due to it being a, for, a, and a split of their current proprietary driver, it's not really what we would call upstream kernel code. It's not like in any way look or act like what any of the graphics drivers or drivers that we have in the tree. So in terms of what can we do with it, I'll, I'll get to it later, but it's like we ain't taking that and sticking it into the kernel. So. And that's kind of the state of play of where we are now with the, uh, on the on the NVIDIA hardware side, on the firmware side. And that leads me into, so, the Nouveau project. Where did that come from and why does that exist? So Nouveau was started in 2007, maybe a bit later, a bit later. Uh, it was that we'd, at that stage that we should do reverse engineer NVIDIA GPUs and write a driver for them ourselves because, you know, we didn't see it as a, a possibility to get something. So uh, it has support in the kernel and user space from NVO4 pretty much up to Ampere in various states of disrepair. Uh, some, some divide, I think, we, I think we got acceleration on, on to Turing, but sometimes Turing just doesn't boot because the firmware doesn't work. And sometimes we have, a, I think we've recently got, I think Ampere support is there. Again, some devices just don't boot because the firmware doesn't boot. Um, but we pretty much have like the minimal acceptable driver to get, either get the operating system to boot, switch off the NVIDIA card so your laptop battery doesn't die, or let you install the NVIDIA binary driver so you can do stuff and have your laptop battery die. Your choices are, <laughs> either way, your laptop battery is probably not gonna be the best thing. Um, but this project, it's, it's stagnated a bit recently. We've, um, there's a lot of reasons. It's not just a simple, oh, you know, it hasn't been. So one big problem we have with a community backed uh, open source driver is when somebody gets good and gets well known in the community, people start offering them jobs, just the way it is. But nobody really offers you a job to work on Nouveau because there's no real, like everyone just, you know, NVIDIA is probably, and Red Hat are probably the only two companies that could even think about doing this. And NVIDIA really haven't, and Red Hat hasn't got enough, you know, we, we don't have enough engineering requirements to support multiple engineers working on this. So it was a bit of a problem. Anytime we've attracted developer attention, they invariably leave and start working on graphics drivers for a company that will pay them because you would. <laughs> Getting paid is important. So it's left us in a bit of a place where we've only really had one full-time developer on this, who's Ben Skeggs, who works at Red Hat. Um, but once the signed firmware thing happened and no power management happened, it got a bit disheartening, I suppose is the word, because you don't ever see a future where you could compete with the real driver. Like one of the better moments in my career has been riding the driver, the RAD-V driver for AMD and beating the AMD stack with an open source driver. Because, you know, we've always said we could do it, but no one's ever gotten to the point. And then when we did, we've done it a couple of times now maybe, but we could never achieve that with NVIDIA hardware. It's just, what was the point of putting all that effort into riding all these things if you were never going to get the reclocking working? So, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, well, no point putting in too much effort. And then while that was sort of going on, Ben was currently also in the firmware loading hell of, can I get these firmwares to load? No, reverse engineer, go to video, reverse engineer, go back to the video cycle that just went around and around. And he wasted a lot of time trying to get firmwares to boot. So, yeah, it, it, it sort of has, a, has had a little break, a stagnant. Uh, so I'll just, go through sort of a little status of where things are when it's sort of it's staying out. So the kernel driver is, you know, Nouveau driver in the kernel. It's been mostly a hardware enablement activity lately. It's mostly been trying to add support for Turing, so to add support for Ampere, trying to get the firmware's NVIDIA give you booting on it. 
the NVIDIA firmwares that they give you aren't the same firmwares they use on their driver, so they don't test them as much. And then you, you know, so it's, it's a constant work on that. The secure build stuff is really complicated life. It's made it very difficult to do anything. There's a lot of stuff that only NVIDIA can really debug. But recently with all of this new firmware plans that they had, uh, we decided, well, look, this firmware will allow us to do all of this stuff. It's a very high level interface. We can write a driver to it. So we've actually started writing the GSP support into the kernel driver. That's the one project that's going on at the moment in that area. So we're sort of hoping to at least be able to prove that we can use the NVIDIA firmware to do display and to do command submission and reclock stuff. So we will see. It has an OpenGL driver in Mesa. In theory, it's, well, I think it has passed OpenGL 4.5 conformance on someone's laptop, but no one has ever submitted it for actual conformance. Uh, we've had horribly broken multi-threading context support. So if you were running a, yeah, if you're running standard single threaded like old games, it might work, but anything modern like Firefoxes or just game modern games would get very confused and it would fall over. But that's actually recently been fixed, thank thankfully. But again, it got to a point the reclocking thing happened, and everyone's like, Well, there's no point writing a highly up or a better optimized compiler if I can't reclock the card. There's no value in it for me. I'm not, you know, it's not gonna be a fun exercise. So again, it's kind of stalled out at that point where it's yeah, it kind of works. It's enough to run your uh, GNOME shell desktop compositor, but anything else, it's it's not really great. But but part of this reboot is well, there's an obvious gap. We don't have, we don't have a Vulkan driver at all. There's been like we have a Vulkan driver for Intro, we have a Vulkan driver for AMD and Mesa, but we've never had a, a Vulkan driver for um, Nouveau. So some sort of news that we did recently is we have started a Vulcan driver, or other Jason here has mostly started a Vulcan driver, with uh, help from myself and one other Carol at Red Hat. Um, so we started like a, just implementing a Vulcan driver for Vulcan Mobile for Kepler to Ampere. Currently it's passing, is that a correct number? 85, less? 92% of the CTS for 1.0. Uh, however, it requires, like we've, We've done, probably going to get it as far as we can in use space, but to actually make it like what we want and what we want, we're going to have to bring the kernel up to meet it. So we, we started, started it, got a kernel we're trying to get the firmware working on, and we got going that way, and then we got the user space and we're getting the Vulcan driver, but this bit's kind of missing. So we're going to require this new user space APIs to finish it off. So what sort of problems do we have in our user space APIs? I, I don't know if anyone's aware uh, with some of the kernel, we've got these old kernel for AMD hardware called Radeon and we've got a new one called AMD GPU. And Radeon is probably the same level as Renewable stopped. And we never continued on to get all the features that the AMD GPU driver has. But the three features we really need to get Vulkan going are these and I'll go through them. So the first one is you need to split the, the buffer objects, so the memory allocations from, the physical memory allocations from the virtual memory allocations. Currently when you allocate a buffer with Nouveau, you say I want this much memory space, you give it a bunch of flags about what the memory space should look, look like, tilings and all these things, and it allocates the physical memory and puts it into the virtual memory space for the process you're running. In, on the GPU side, GPU is virtual memory space. That's fine for OpenGL, but it doesn't work for Vulkan, you need, to have that done in two steps. You need to be allocating the physical memory in one step, and then you have to attach ranges or pieces of that physical memory allocation into the virtual memory spa address space with all these flags set. And splitting that API is uh, pretty much a fundamental thing we have to do to get proper Vulkan support. Um, so that's sort of step one. The second thing is we need to thing called sync objects. So there's these uh, synchronization objects where when you submit work to the GPU, you have to you pass in an array of objects to wait on, the work to do, and an array of objects to signal. And when you do multiple submissions, you can have those work off each other. So the scheduler and the kernel can go, oh, this turn, this one needs to wait on this stuff. I won't I won't send it to the hardware till I see that signal. And the, it's how you do proper interleaving. Now, in theory, we could get away without this, but I think Jason. I said he does not want to do hack arounds for this. So 
we're going to we're going to have to get some sort of synchronization object handling done. Um, and this both of these kind of lead to the, the the final change, which is well, if we're doing these things, we may as well try and bring ourselves up to what was considered a modern uh, virtual memory management and execu execution API that supports what Vulkan needs. Uh, in, in our community, that's been called, thing called VM bind. Uh, we've been looking at it for the Intel driver. AMD GPU has a lot of the pieces of it. Uh, I think there's been another couple of drivers that are interested in doing it. So it's like a, it's an API for managing the virtual memory's address space and command submission but also doing them on a sort of a timeline. So you can sort of say, here's a bunch of execution, and when that's finished, here's a bunch of virtual memory changes, and when that's finished, here's more execution, and you can interleave things, and uh, the Vulkan API is support for that through a thing called Sparse. So um, these are what I would say non-trivial projects. <laughs> They're quite large, and they are probably going to be sort of blocker to move forward with Nuvo and the users and the, the Vulkan driver. So when we when we get the reclocking bits in place, these are the sort of priorities we have to hit. We started looking into them, but there's yeah, there's a good bit of work and they're kind of interleaved. Every time I start looking into this, I get into one of those, oh, this bit needs that bit needs that bit. And you keep going around in circles, going back to where you started. It's like, how do we how do we figure out where to start and how to do it incrementally? It's one of these, if you implemented all these three APIs and dropped them on the mailing list. You'd be, I don't know, probably a few thousand lines or maybe 10, 20,000 lines. It'd be a lot of code to review, a lot of patches. How do we do that incrementally? How do we put it into the kernel slowly? How do we get a starting point? So there's a bit of you know, management work about how we can actually upstream it, even as we do it. So also there's a few upcoming problems that we haven't really faced yet. One is the firmware size. So 30 meg firmware is kind of big. We like to stick the firmwares into the init RAM FS. You might have three or four different init RAM FSs. And people always go, oh, my boot slash boot runs out of space. Well, this is going to exasperate your slash boot running out of space. Um, it's, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a problem. It's like, I'm not sure how much of a problem it's going, but it's exasperated even more by the fact that currently the NVIDIA firmwares that are, we are getting don't have any stable firmware ABI. So they version lock their whole stack, their firmware, their open driver kernel module, their user space, uh, it's all version locked. It all only works if everything's in the same number, which is great for them, not so good for us. So the problem comes if we go, okay, here on their 515 version driver, we start on that. But then they fix something in their 540 that we need, or they add a hardware support. Now we have to ship the 515 and the 540. And then on 580, they had something new and more hardware support. We have to ship the 15, the 40, and the 80. Like we would not want to ship every single one they released because that would really, <laughs> we, but we're going to have to monitor what's a bug fix, what's needed, what's going. So there's a lot of overhead on what happens. And as we stack up the ones that we decide to up support in the upstream kernel, those ones have to maintain, continuously be shipped. Um, I'm trying to think of ways that we can work around this, like by, maybe just waiting to work on, on the root partition before we load the graphics driver and, you know, doing stuff. You could be have not in the old days, that would have been a pain because we wouldn't have had VGA, but UEFI, it mightn't be as bad a, a, a problem that we can actually just delay loading and not stick these in the init RAM FS at all. Uh, I will see, I haven't fully thought out the consequences of this yet, but um, it may be an option. So far we've only had we're only, we're only been looking at the R515 release driver, so you know, there's been a couple of bug fixes to that firmware, but yeah, it's, we, we have not got a good plan on how to deal with this long term because it's going to get messy. Of course, yeah, we will be discussing it with NVIDIA over time and seeing what can change, but at this stage, that's where we're at. And then, kind of more, what's, you know, what other sort of plans and possibilities do, does this enable? Well. Putting this into Nouveau, it's sort of like hammering in the NVIDIA firmware API into a driver that has its own idea of how all the things work and all its own layering. Like, it may make sense not to do that. It may make sense to just stand up a brand new driver that just do, that does that with the user API of Nouveau or something, a new user API on top of it. It may be a smaller, you know, 
uh, maintainability, and it lets you forget about the old stuff. It lets you not forget about it, but it lets you, you know, it's in a different driver. It's not going to get disturbed, but it's going forward, and we just concentrate on this path for choring forever. There's a question from online from Conan Kudo. It says, maybe simple DRM to Novia handoff would fix that firmware problem? Yeah, that, the question is whether yeah, the simple DRM, we can use simple DRM to do the handoff. Yeah, that's one of the other things that kind of let us maybe just skip loading the driver till later, that we've changed things so that we don't have a frame buffer driver. We've got the simple DRM driver, and we could do, you know, graphical stuff and Wayland stuff and things without having brought up the NVIDIA drivers, the Nouveau driver loaded. So yeah, it helps that problem, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not just a, a simple solution. Um, so yeah, that's kind of up in the air whether there's, you know, we could do something with a, a GSP only driver. Also the idea of like, now that we're able to accelerate, now we can actually reclock the firmware and do stuff. Can we build something that can do compute properly? Can we build like a stack that's actually cross vendor and not proprietary, like, a, like something that's, if you look at the compute scene at the moment, there's CUDA, there's Rockham from AMD, there's one API from Intel, it's all vendor, 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 there's no cooperation, there's no community, there's nothing around it, it's pretty much, a, everyone just cares about themselves. Can we fix that? Like, now that we have the ability to actually run something on all the three GPU vendors, can we fix that? Can we get something that's useful in the ARM space? Can we get something that's common code that in you know, what we've done with the kernel, we do that in user space more. It's, it's a big open question. We've done it for Vulkan, we've done it for OpenGL. I don't see why we can't do it, but you know, it's gonna take a lot of time and probably a lot of money. So, you know, I think that's all I got. Yeah, so if there's any questions, I don't think I've forgotten anything. But... Uh, I have a question. Oh, online? Yeah. Where is it? Online. Yeah. Online, yeah. yeah. Uh, re regards to the computer stack, and you, you know, uh, so far, uh, there is many uh, computer stack uh, in, in, in the community, such as the AMD have a Rockon, uh, Rockon's computer stack, and uh, and Intel have Leo uh, computer stack as well. Uh, do you have any plan to uh, Develop a, a unified compute stack, uh, such as the DRM uh, graphics, uh, to uh, in uh, for for the general uh, uh, GPU uh, portion. Yeah, I didn't quite get all of that, but I, I think the question was about creating like a general compute stack. I can get the, the start of it. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, well, the, the, the plan is that, yeah, there should, we should be able to come up with some sort of compute stack that's like, you know, based on DRM, does everything the same as the graphics stack, same as we've done with Mesa. Uh, we lack an API to do it too so far, but OpenCL kind of is the API, but may not be the one we want. Um, there's a bit of work there to be done. But yeah, I think this opens the possibility of doing that. I, I hope that answered the question. If not, type okay. it in. And, I can I can hear it. Okay, I see. Hey. So. Yeah, I'll just get it on the mic. I know we're supposed to talk. Hey, so isn't there something like a Vulkan compute as well? Yeah, so the, the question is Vulkan compute stack is it Vulkan compute's a thing. Um, it is, but it's only really a, uh, sort of like more for your sort of App desk copy game type situation. It's not really a compute stack that's going to do what CUDA can do or can do. It's more of the replacement for OpenGL. It's, it's gotten better than OpenGL compute by a long way, but it's not gotten all the way there yet. I think Jason. Um, yes, yeah, so there, there is desire within Konos and other places to make Vulkan something that you can use for what you might call more serious compute or scientific compute, but it's never going to become the full software stack that like CUDA is today. So CUDA, you've got single source and you've got all this compiler stuff that happens and all these tools. Vulkan at the most would ever only be like the runtime underneath and there's still a whole software stack to build on top of it. So 
while the runtime may eventually get capable of that, it's never going to be the whole thing. There's always going to have to be something else. Any other questions? Um, I also wanted to um, ask about the inner MFS and firmware bundling. Um, so I suspect that not all systems initialize the frame buffer on the newer GPUs in BIOS or FE. So you would always have to bundle that firmware into the inner drum, into the inner drum FS, right? Like on ARM systems. Sorry, I, I missed a bit. I mean, like, um, on x86, the GPU, I believe, is initialized by BIOS and you get simple DRM out of it, right? But on ARM systems, you always have to bundle the firmware into the inner drum FS because the GPU is not initialized by anything. Yeah, so that, that's the question is that, yeah, so the x86, you know, you get your BIOS at UEFI, and it's the frame buffer device for you, but on a lot of ARM systems, you don't have anything till the graphics driver loads. There is nothing setting up some of the devices, especially on more on the embedded side. I think on the bigger side, it's not so bad. But yeah, I, I, I think at that point, you're going, we're going to have to, you know, see what what we can do because again, they're going to have the same problem. Maybe we should. Yeah, that's when you get into can U boot do something, or is there some way we can? But there's probably not much. The old in the old days, what used to happen was someone would stick an X86 emulator into your into your U boot and boot it that way. But hey, so with U boot, it's there is FE implementation now, so it might be possible to start some sort of an FE binary, which would initialize the GPU, possibly, yeah. maybe. They, they did something like that with network cards already to boot yeah. from iSCSI, so maybe. I don't know what would happen if somebody, crazy person, decides to take the NVIDIA GSP firmware and load it at U-boot time, bring up the card there, and then boots the operating system and tries to reinstall a newer version of the GPU firmware on it while it's running. Uh, I would suggest someone should try that at home and not near me. <laughs> kind of, I suppose. Yeah, the BIOS, I don't think, has quite that much functionality in it. I was just saying, uh, this is probably what the driver does already today. I mean, there's a the UEFI option room in the card is probably already loading something in there. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh, I mean, we went down that path for other things in the past. And yes, the firmware were smaller, but they were still big for the time. And the, the, the end result is often, is often, do we really need to have a frame buffer? At that point, uh, can we boot more quickly and then have user space on the final system bring the rest of the thing up? Yeah, no, with it's, the NVIDIA stuff, you can't do anything to develop the firmware. Well, well, exactly. My point is the initial MFS might not be the right way to, to do that. Yeah. And have a small initial MFS boot quicker to the real root and then get your firmware. Uh, well, I was just sitting in the session. Um, after Leonard's yesterday in System D, and talking about reworking the NIT RD system, and the presenter from Red Hat there, quite with quite a straight face, suggested that they should put the entire sound stack and the entire graphic stack inside the inner RD so that it was available to debug possible boot problems. <laughs> you might remember my strong disagreement <laughs> with this approach. <laughs> Hmm. Not yet. Uh, over. Excuse me. Can you forward this? Is that um, well, I mean, since I've been called out, uh, I would say that. Uh, I mean, we are talking about a few times, uh, maybe thirty megabytes, right? Um, so it sounds like you, if you have multiple kernels and you want to support multiple cards, you need, uh, well, let's say a storage of. 300 megabytes, uh, 500 megabytes. Uh, if you are smart about this, you can load just one of those firmwares from the uh, yeah. specific boot. And I think this is entirely doable, right? I mean, yeah, and I've actually, I brought that up recently on Fedora mailing list about whether we could actually just package the firmwares into a separate init RAMFS or something like that so that we don't have to have three of them for every, ker every kernel. Yeah, the kernel. technology is pretty much there. Yeah. We start flogging that horse to death. Uh, at the end of the day, 
I still maintain that having something that is loaded by the pre-boot environment, which is always going to be slow, is not the right approach. You are just putting a kernel that has device drivers for the file system, for the block storage, and yeah. for whatever it is you have that are fast, that are optimized, and is perfectly capable of loading large that's, files. That's, that's fine until someone encrypts your root file system with Chinese characters and they want to input it onto your graphical system while uh, you're, before you have the root file system mounted. Yes, using a screen. Well, but then, <laughs> then you put it in your BIOS. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like that's a long-standing problem that actually we wanted to fix, but we have never fixed. It's like it leads a lot of work in. Oh, you have multiple routes, and you have a pre-early route where you you load from. And my point is, any TramFS is not the right answer to this. How is having a separate route different from having an any TramFS? It still takes takes up disk space. It's still something you wouldn't you believe how much quicker the kernel is going to load that thing from, I don't know, you would. Probably. Yeah, I think the problem is because Grub has to pull it in from your disk, it's going to be faster than that. Because <laughs> Grub sometimes can be quite slow doing that stage uh, for uh, unknown uh, reasons. Only if you're running Grub still on BIOS boot, then sometimes the in 13 stuff is slow. I've never seen, seen disk access being slow in UEFI. Yeah. So, and and you you still need to maintain uh, that separate root file system, and you need to keep everything on there in, in sync. So your 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 instead of having an initrd generator, you now do the need an initrd generator like Raygood and a separate special root file system generator, which you also need to maintain and yada yada. And separate file system constraints because of <laughs> additional partition. So we know it's hard. <laughs> Who's going to fix it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're finished with you. The horse is dead. Oh, there's someone left. Oh, um, let me read. So Jeremy Linton says that EGK2 has an x86 emulator that can run x86 PCI option runs. <laughs> this can <laughs> bootstrap some AMD and NVIDIA cards. Who would have thought? Yeah, so when were you doing that in the PowerPC years ago, Ben? Oh, yeah. But is this the 16-bit uh, mode only one for old school uh, BIOS ROMs, or is that a full protected mode one that can actually run EFI? Yeah, it's on there. Because EFI ROMs are a whole kettle of fish. They call through pointers. They have assumption on data structure that having fixed offsets. Usually, you can't do that. So it's probably just x 6 mu for running the old school 16-bit ROMs and nothing else. Otherwise, insanity prevail. I mean, there's a reason why the bytecode stuff never flew with UFI, right? It's just... The answer here is that NVIDIA needs to provide an option ROM for the ARM systems so that they have their BIOS, so they have their screen before you get to U-boot or, you know, like a real server would. All right, cool. I've read that up there, yeah, so. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming. And uh, hope you have a good dinner. <laughs> good